him and his friend, I think he was about nine years old at the time, they were going to a local park one morning and they came across this cigar shaped thing on the ground. They went up to it, the door opened, these human like beings were there. He said they looked Asian or Oriental. They had bright clothing on, wore a little turban. Mm -hmm. they, went in, they went inside, they conversed with them in English and off they went. And this was 1911. And, and I thought about editing the book and putting it in there, but I thought if yeah. I do that, I'll, I'll 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 put it to one side again, and I'll 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 never get it finished. So right. I, I I wrote an article about it instead. But the thing is, you know, I was interviewed again a while back, and somebody said to me, "Where have all the Space Brothers gone, Philip?" Because in the 1950s, the aliens and in inverted commas were the blonde, blue-eyed Venusians who were in touch with. George Adamski and, and mm -hmm. company, and then they come to save the Earth. Well, Philip Mantle is a long-standing UFO researcher and author from the UK. He was formerly the Director of, of Investigations for the British UFO Research Association, normally known as Bufora and the Mutual UFO Network, which is known as MUFON. He's the founder of Flying Disc Press. He recently published his latest book, UFO Landings UK, and he joins us now. Hi, Philip. Uh, good afternoon, Dean. Nice to speak to you. Great to have you back again. Um, yeah, this is a, an interesting book. Has there been any specific publications dedicated just to Uf, uh, UK UFO events? Um. There are around one or two, yes. I mean, um, my very first book, for example, Dean, was called Without Consent, and that dealt with um, abductions and missing time cases, purely from the, UK, uh, the, the UK. I know a gentleman by the name of Peter Padgett wrote a book. I think that was simply called, you know, UFO UK. So there has been one or two, but certainly not a lot. Um, I, think, I think there's room for, for more. Yeah, and I guess we get caught up mostly with what happens here in the US as far as uh, UFOs and UFO landings are concerned, but how prevalent are they in the UK? Well, you, you bang on right there, Dean. You know, most of what we hear about or read about is, is you know, is from uh, across the Atlantic in the United States. But I think, you know, per capita, per, per head of population, I don't think it's, it's that much different here. I think that... What, what we have in the United States is more media. I mean, you in the United States, they had lots of TV channels while we still had two or three, mm -hmm. for example, you know. Um, so there's, there's much more access to the media. Uh, I think we've caught up a bit on that, but I think, I think there's a, an advantage there. And also in academia, you know, you can go and, and, and lecture at the colleges and what have you in, and schools in the US, but you're not allowed to do that here unless it's part of the curriculum. You know, so there are there are differences, but I, th I think we can we can stand on our own, uh, Dean, when it comes to the UFO phenomena. C can you remember your first investigation of a UFO landing over there in the UK? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I I, I joined. What well, I live in the county of West Yorkshire, and originally Yorkshire was just one big county, but they split it up into four: north, south, east, and west. And um, when I first got interested, I joined a newly formed UFO group, simply called the Yorkshire UFO Society. And I hadn't been involved that long uh, when I did some local publicity, you know, my local newspaper. And a lady rang me and she said, Philip, you won't believe me. You won't believe me. You won't believe me. So I said, well, give us a chance, you know. So the area in which I lived and still do live, I'm, I'm only a few miles from where I was born, then was a big coal mining community. Uh, my father worked down the coal mine all his life. They've all gone now, but it was all coal mines, a few mills, factories. And this lady lived in a small town in West Yorkshire called Normanton, which was surrounded by coal mines. Um, the, the, the main um, motorway, in, in the northwest where I live, goes straight past Normanton. It's called the M62. You could probably call it a highway in the, in the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, my, myself and my, my colleague, Mark Birdsell, went to uh, speak to this lady. She was called Mrs. Westerman. And her husband, just like my father, worked down the local coal mine. And 
she got several children and now she lived in, in a terraced house, but it was an elevated house, Dean. So you had to go up half a dozen steps to get in the front door. There was no houses opposite. And uh, the bottom of the street was a cul-de-sac. And at the bottom of the cul-de-sac was some trees, a little stream, and then there was a field with some electricity pylons on. So it was just after lunch, the children were playing outside, they were playing a ball game. And Mrs. Westerman is literally, you know, washing the dishes after lunch. One of them came running in and said, Mom, Mom, there's an aeroplane crashed in the field. Mm. So she, naturally, she's concerned. She come out with the front door, and because it was elevated, she could see across these fields at the bottom of the cul-de-sac. And she says, Philip, it, it wasn't an aeroplane. It was something on the ground that was shaped like a Mexican hat. And it was like a, a, a gray silver color. So she got the children, walked down the street, down through the cul-de-sac. When you go past the trees, you go down a little dip so that they lost sight of this field. Come up the other side and the field was surrounded by a fence. This thing is still there on the ground, but now there are three tall men, all in white um, boiler suits, as we call them. You might call them coveralls, or we call them overalls as well. Mm -hmm. um, they had a visor over their face. They were that close, they could see that they weren't wearing gloves, they were actually wearing mittens. And they were waving something across the ground. Uh, one of the children tried to climb this fence and Mrs. Westerman held him back. And at this point, these three, beings walked to the rear of this thing it took off stopped in midair and then shot off at an angle like a bat out of hell mm -hmm. didn't make a wow. noise and quite naturally she was astounded by it um but like a lot of people i would imagine she thought this will be all over the news tonight it's a lovely sunny day lots of people are out and about Whilst Normanton is not a huge town, it's a busy little place. And like I said, you've got the motorway going right past it. So she sits down that evening, watch the local TV news, nothing. She bought the local newspaper, which is still published today. It comes out once a week, nothing. Not a, not a mention of it anywhere. So she even asked some of her neighbors if they'd seen anything, not a thing. We even interviewed, we interviewed Mrs. Westerman and all the children we even interviewed one of the children's friends. He hadn't seen it because he'd actually gone home for his lunch. Mm -hmm. And this happened just after lunchtime. And when he came back, it was all over with. And he, he, he remarked how, how excited everybody was. Now, she, none of them called it a spaceship or aliens. They just said this thing on the ground. And like I said, it, it puzzled them almost as much that it seemed that no one else was a witness to it than the, the fact that she saw it in the first place. And what, what is interesting, Dean, um, a couple of years back, just, just I think it was just as lockdown was starting, I did a, an interview with someone and I told him about this incident and I forgot to mention the lady's name because initially she, she wouldn't allow us to use it. This is going back to 1980. Yep. yep. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, I got an email from a lady in New Zealand. And she says, Philip, what was that lady's name? I listened to your own ex podcast. And I can't remember what it was. She says, I used to live in Normanton. So I, I emailed her back and said it was Mrs. Westerman. She says, my best friend was called Westerman when I lived there. Okay. And she emailed her. And her best friend was one of those children that I interviewed all those years ago. Wow. She's got a different name now because she's married. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I communicated with her via, via email and she literally put in bullet points, Dean, we saw this, bump, 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 bump. Uh, we were thinking about arranging to meet because none of us knew what was going to happen with the pandemic, but we've never got around to it, sadly. Um, but it was astonishing. And what it did, as I said, Dean, I hadn't been involved in, in, in UFO research very long. But it confirmed to me that there was something worthy of me investing my time and money in it. Uh, and it wasn't it could, because all the books I'd read were all pretty much based in, in America mm -hmm. and Roswell and all this kind of stuff, you know, whatever. Um, but here was something that literally happened in, in my backyard. And um, I've, I've, I've run that story in the local newspaper a couple of times just to see if anyone else would step forward. But we had no luck with that. 
Um, but but that, that that was the one that got me got me interested in in this type of uh, case, UFO landing cases. Right, right. And and even so, I was reading with interest. Uh, even before you investigated that case, you you were still a little bit dubious about whether you might be wasting your time or not. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I'd read a lot about the subject, but like I said, it, most of what I'd read was across the Atlantic, and there was nothing I could do about that. And um, I was still finding my feet, if you like. Mark, Mark Birdsell and Graham Birdsell, they founded the Yorkshire UFO Society, and they'd already been involved for a few years. And uh, when I went to their very first meeting, they put on a presentation. So I knew there was something there, but I never thought for a moment, Dean, that I, I, I'd be sat here 40 plus years later mm -hmm. still yeah. talking about the subject. I very naively thought I'll, I'll attend a few uh, meetings, read some more books, write a few letters, and I'll get all the answers that I, that I need in no time at all. You know, what a fool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I was young and naive, but once I've got a case like this in, 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 your, in your neighborhood, as you would say in, in the States, then I thought, well, that is, I think there is something to this, and it's worth me investing my, my time in it. Um, but like I said, I never thought I'd be here all these years later. But, that, but that's what got me up and running. Yeah. Yeah. The UK has a really rich history of, of, of UFO events. How far back do they go and did you include in the book? Yeah, there's one, there's one in the book from, um, I think it's the 8th century, right at the beginning. Because the way the book is structured, we, uh, I look at the, the phenomena decade by decade. Mm -hmm. um, but... We all, we all know that come June the 24th of this year, it's the 75th anniversary of the Kenneth Arnold sighting. And that's when the, the phrase flying saucers came into popular culture. So we, you know, we use that as a starting point, but there were things reported prior to that. And uh, the one in, in uh, I think it's 17 something or other, seven something or other, there's all kinds of words that we don't use in our vocabulary anymore, the way to describe it, but they do say it turned out to be a triangle or a pyramidal shape. Right. Well, you know, it's it's over this last probably 20 or 30 years that the flying triangle uh, has become a very popular um, part of the UFO subject. Started in the, the mid 80s and then through Belgium into the late 80s and 90s and so on. Um, so there are, there are links to it and um, one of the cases, uh, it's not that far, far before um, Kenneth Arnold, it happened in 1943 in the, here in the UK. It was a gentleman by the name of John Warren. And the, the, the reason I talk about this is because I met Mr. Warren in person. Um, I, can't, I haven't got a time machine to go back. <laughs> but um, I, I, I got married and I moved a few miles up the road and I, I did some, some, some more PR. And Mr. Warren contacted me. And now he was in the Royal Air Force during the war. And he was stationed at a place called uh, RAF Ludham, which was near Norwich in Norfolk. And um, he was a, um, an armourer. So when, they, when the aircraft were going out on their missions, he would be in charge of loading them with their, with their ordnance, so to speak. And on the, I think it was May 1943, and we don't know the exact date, he had an evening off. So he got a pass in the other evening and he went to a, a dance at a little town nearby. And Mr. Warren missed the last train back. This was the time when a lot of the little towns here in the UK, all our little train stations, most of them have gone now. So he thought, oh no, because if you got late back, you were in trouble. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the 12 miles that he had to walk that worried him. It was the fact that he was going to be late and he thought, yeah. oh, I'm going to be in trouble. And um, so off he goes. As he's approaching the base, obviously it's dark, and the upper head he sees like a, a green glow. And he, you know, he knows the place like the back of his hand. As he approaches this area, it is a, a humanoid figure stood by the side of the road, perfectly still. It has a box on its chest. And the top of this box is emitting a green light, and it dis distorts the, the, the image of this, this creature. It looks like it's got a big grin on its face. I don't know if you ever did that as a young so Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And then behind it on the grass verge, there is a, an object on the ground that Mr. Wallen said was shaped like a bell tent. And then to the left were, and behind were two more figures. And he was petrified. And he said he couldn't get back to the base quick enough. Luckily for him, one of his friends was waiting up for him and let him in through a window. So he, he didn't get into trouble in that respect. But it, it's, it certainly puzzled him. And, and I remember sitting in Mr. Wallen's living room with a cup of tea discussing this and he, he, I, he, he didn't allow me to publish it. So I, I haven't put it in this book, I got, but he said, Philip, had I, had I been armed, I would have shot it. Yeah. Because he said, you know, this is 1943. It's the middle of the war. I knew it wasn't one of us. So it had to be one of, one of them, the enemy. And he said, I would have shot it. Hmm. But he said, obviously you don't take your arm, you don't take a gun to a dance. So I, I wasn't armed, you know, and, the, you know, in the book that is, he reported it first in the 1960s and the letter he got in reply, he still kept in his possession. So I've put that in the book. He also did a little drawing of this thing. That's in the book as well. And I don't know about you, Dean, but I remember sitting in, in Mr. Warren's living room and he, when he's talking about it, he's, you can see that kind of far away look. He, he, right. He's been living it in his, in his mind. He can see it in his mind's eye. And... Um, it, it stuck with him, you know, till his dying day, as far as I'm aware. And, he, and you know, and you know, I just feel um, it's extremely honoured to meet these people and sit in their homes and discuss these things with them face to face, um, as I did with Mrs. Westerman. You know, I mean, Mrs. Westerman wouldn't allow us to take a photograph. You know, mm -hmm. Mr. Warren did. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Westerman said, "You can't use my, my name. You know, don't take a photograph of me." Yeah. And, the children even play when the ball game they were playing outside was it was a made up game. It's not a game you'll see anywhere, but it's the kind of game I played when I was their age. Like I said, I was born and raised in a little mining community. Um, so, you know, I used Hynex classification of high strangeness to look at these cases. And as Hynex said, you know, the closer you get to these things, the more witnesses are involved. If it leaves any, you know, residues behind in the environment, if there's any documentation, each part of that is a layer of high strangeness. And, and these cases will have it to a lesser or greater degree. And maybe we should concentrate on those. Mm -hmm. You know, Mrs. Westerman yeah. and, and the children were a matter of yards away from this thing. thing. And, you know, this is not something that you can see, you know, half a mile in the distance, they're up close and personal. Same with Mr. Warren. He had to walk past this thing on the road to get to get back to the, the barracks where he, where, he, where right. he was residing. So the, the chances then, as UFO researchers, we know that most sightings reported to us have a conventional explanation. We know that. But when you have incidents like this, you know, how, to, how could they have misidentified something when they're so close to it? Yeah, you know, so they're either telling the truth or they're lying, and I could find no reason why they would want to lie. You know, yeah, so yeah, something bizarre is happening here. Yeah, and and in both those cases, it kind of highlights, um, you know, a little bit of a phenomenon with um, with close contact experiences where the the ETs don't seem to be phased when they're actually spotted. In both those cases, they just went about their business as if nothing was happening. Exactly, you know, as if we're, we're of no consequence whatsoever. Um, as you know, I run a small publishing concern called Flying Disc Press. And one of the books I, I published was from a, um, a Romanian scientist called Dr. Dan Farkas. He wrote a book simply called UFOs Over Romania. He followed it up with another book called Hyper Civilizations, which was his theory to try and explain the phenomena. But one of the things that really puzzled Dr. Farkas was well, he, he calls them the euphonauts. He said, that, and the euphonauts act, they seem to be dumb. They do stupid things. Right. You know, in other words, if, if you are up close to something, you could expect a reaction from them, but they don't. They just take no notice whatsoever. Um, on occasion, not all the time, of course. Uh, and like I said, you know, certainly with Mrs. Westerman, it's, uh, it's almost as if you had to be there at that time at that loca location to, to have this encounter because nobody else seems to have seen anything. 
you know, and like I said, it's a busy little area. Um, but it could be we've just not, not found them. I mean, you know, we have to take that in as a possibility, but it's it's certainly very puzzling. And I asked, I asked Mr. Warren, you didn't you know anybody else at the base? He said, Well, you know, it, it was, I don't know, gone midnight. He said there was nobody about. Well, you know, operations were suspended for the day. We didn't fly at night, we weren't nighttime bombers. And he said, So I, I didn't hear anyone else say anything unusual. He said, I certainly wasn't mm -hmm. going to tell anybody, you know. I said, well, why didn't you tell anybody? And it's, again, it's funny how his mind reacts. He says, well, I would have had to have admitted to being late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was still more a bit worried about saying I got, I got back late. Um, as strange as that seems, you know, we, we as humans don't always react how we think we would do when we have these encounters as well. Yeah. That, yep. was a, that was a strange little thing about it. Um, there's another, there's a lady in the book called Sasha, Sasha Christie. Her account happened, I think it's in the 90s. I'm terrible at dates, so please forgive mm -hmm. me. And she was in Wales. And her and her friend and children were staying at a holiday cottage they rented for, for a few days. And they saw this. The first thought it was like a thunderstorm. But it, as it went out, these, these lights are coming closer, slow. They got closer and closer and bigger and bigger. Um, Something grabbed one of the children. She saw these things on the ground. Um, it's a very personal account, is Sasha. So I can't do it justice by, by glossing over it. But again, what puzzled her even more, and I met, I was speaking to Sasha again just recently, is when her partner and the children went back in the house, back in the cottage, they all acted as if nothing had happened. Hmm. The children sat down in front of the TV. Her partner, I think it was what he was washing the dishes, and she stood there thinking, what the hell's going on? Because we they reacted as if nothing had happened, but she knew something had happened, you know. Yeah. Um, so there is that side of it as well that is is very puzzling. And um I may, I mean, you know, make of it what you will. Yeah. was 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 she and her family um abducted or well, they think there's a period of missing time, um, but Sasha's not for having any regression or anything like that. Her partner, Steve, um, ex-partner now, has just spoken out about it for the first time. Hence, he's not in the book. He, he came out and said, I'll yeah. talk about it once I've written it. But um, Sasha has, has showed a little video interview uh, of him uh, and he was quite happy to talk about it. And he, he, he was considering going down that avenue. But I, I think I think he's still considering the best options. But there certainly seems to be a period of missing time. Yeah. D did you get the feeling that the uh, UFO phenomena was just as big pre-flying saucer uh, era, like, you know, 1945, uh, as it is now? Well, absolutely. I mean... I don't know if it's as big. I think in, today it's much easier to report it. Um, as you know, I, I was very much involved with Calvin Parker and it, his event uh, happened in Mississippi in 1973. One of the witnesses that we, that we, we interviewed, uh, not Calvin, uh, uh, an independent witness, I asked him, I said, did you report it? This is back in 1973. He says, who the hell am I going to report it to? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there's no Ghostbusters. And he said, I, I told my family about it. He said, but who do you tell? He says, you see Charlie and Calvin on the TV being ridiculed. So that's the last place you're going to go. Yeah. And he said, but there was, who do you report it to? So it's when I, when I um, joined the Yorkshire UFO Society back in 1980, Dean, obviously it's pre-internet days. We, we tried to make ourselves as visible as possible. In other words, we give our phone number and our address to reference libraries, police stations, airports, even pubs. We go in and take and we put this, this leaflet up on your notice board in your pub. And one of the things we always used to ask when somebody had a phoned us or wrote to us, it was, how did you find out about us? So we knew what, what, was, what was the best ways that were working that we'd done. And we did lectures and, and local PR and that things like that. So you know, things were busy, but, but I think today just makes it 
because of the technology that we have, it's just far easier. You can log on a website now and click mm -hmm. your details in and off it goes and that's it, done. Um, I've been watching the, um, the hearings at, at Congress today. I don't yep. know if you've seen any of that, but they've got a, a, what seems like, a, I, I kind of shook my head because they've got a reporting procedure in place now and you put it in, you fill in a form and off it goes. Well, it's kind of what we were doing, you know, in the 1980s, but we did it manually rather than electronically. You know? yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking they're going to have something really high tech, you know, but no, no it's, it's just a form. <laughs> so, so there you go. But yeah. um, there was certainly, certainly a lot of things around that were reported. Yes. And it, yeah. And as you mentioned earlier too, you know, pre-1945, they used different terminology, which, you know, yeah. you, st you still had to kind of decipher. Well, of course, during the Second World War, it was the Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. These were Swain's Lights, um, witnessed by, you know, the, the Allied uh, air crews, which they assumed was possibly some kind of enemy aircraft. And, of course, at the end of the war, they found out that the, the Axis, you know, they were reporting them as well, and they thought it, it, was, it, it was the Allies. Yeah. And, of course, it was neither of them. And then go back to the end of the 19th century we had the phantom airships and these things were seen over the uk here there and everywhere even winston churchill one of our most famous uh, prime ministers although he wasn't prime minister at the time even though he mentioned the airships um so you know it kind of parallels with what was seen in the in the us in, in some respects yeah and i guess the further you go back in in history um UFO sightings would suddenly, you know, undertake religious connotations. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then again, you know, if you're looking at, in, in the book, I've also um, taken in the Republic of Ireland, because although it's not part of the UK technically, politically, it is joined onto Northern Ireland. We are, mm -hmm. we are two islands next to each other. And of course, they are a very predominantly Roman Catholic country. They even had a, a, you know, a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary there and have a, a big shrine and all that kind of thing. Um, and uh, But what happened was, uh, uh, frustrating in some respects, but interesting in others. When we go talk about old sightings, I'd written the book. The, the book was due to be published a couple of years ago, but it got held up by the pandemic. And last year I did some TV work and a local guy um, contacted me, emailed me, can I come and see you? So when COVID restrictions allowed, he came around and this was a, nothing he'd seen. It was his wife's grandfather. And it, he'd been, as I told you, this whole area was, a, was mine, coal mines. He'd been a mining engineer. And he said shortly before he died, he wrote his memoirs. And these weren't a huge, massive, great tome. Um, and he split it into two parts. One, as his life growing up, and two, part of a, as a mining engineer. And this chap told me, he says, the, the engineering bit's really boring. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But, but in the other half, and he'd done this just for his family, thing, nobody else. So I think there was only 10 copies printed. Um, there is one, and it's the largest chapter in the whole thing, and it's called The Encounter. And he details his own encounter in 1911. Uh, he lived near Manchester, which is about 40 miles from here. Him and his friend, I think he was about nine years old at the time, they were going to a local park one morning. And they came across this cigar-shaped thing on the ground. They went up to it, the door opened, these human-like beings were there, he said they looked... Asian or Oriental. They had bright clothing on, wore a little turban. Mm -hmm. they, went in, they went inside, they conversed with them in English, and off they went. And this was 1911. And, and I thought about editing the book and putting it in there, but I thought if yeah. I do that, I'll, 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 I'll put it to one side again and I'll, I'll, I'll never get it finished. So right. I, I, I wrote an article about it and said, but the thing is, you know, I was interviewed again a while back and somebody said to me, where have all the Space Brothers gone, Philip? Because in the 1950s, the aliens and in inverted commas were the blonde, blue-eyed Venusians who were in touch with George Adamski and, and mm -hmm. company and they come to save the Earth, you know? 
uh, going to save us from ourselves. Well, this was pretty much like that, but it was 40 years earlier. Uh, and nobody had seen this Dean, apart from a few members of his family. Yeah. So he allowed me to photocopy it, and then I write an article about it. And it, it, it was really puzzling. And this yeah. thing was on the ground. Mm -hmm. Hence, I thought about putting it in the book, but I thought, no, best not. Yeah. Everyone knows about Rendlesham Forest in 1980. Did that actually qualify as a, a UFO landing? Because the report suggested hovered. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I never actually considered the, the, uh, the Rendlesham case to go in the book simply because it was too big. Mm hmm and it's, it's so well known. I mean, there's whole books being written about it, and I believe that, that there are some more on the way. Um, I've even published one myself. I didn't write it, but I, I published a huge, great volume on it. Um, so I thought, I, I don't really think I can do it. I can't, you know, yeah. I can't really justify it in, in maybe a couple of pages. Um, so for that reason, it, it didn't make the cut. And then there's the argument, of course, well, was it on the ground or was it not, you know? But if it's, if it's only a couple of feet, I'll, I'll accept that, you know? That's, right. that's close right. enough. Yeah. But uh, I just thought it was too, too big a case. What I wanted to do was to, where I could, was concentrate on these cases that, you know, have fallen by the wayside. And perhaps, certainly in... in you know, overseas countries outside of the UK, they will have never have heard of them mm -hmm. before. Yep. And, yep. and that's been like a, an underlying theme of comments on the book. People have come down and said, oh, you know, uh, Philip, I never, I never heard of this case or that case. And another chap said, I've lived here, you know, I've been involved for 30 years and I've never heard of these. And, and that was one of the, you know, the reasons for writing the book. Um, but so Rendlesham, I, I thought about it, but it, it, it didn't make it, I'm afraid. Yeah. Does the UK have a, a history of UFO crashes like, say, Roswell style here in the US? And if they do, I mean, are there any reports of UFOs that have been, you know, whisked away and, and held in some hangar somewhere? The, the only one is, is one in Wales um, on, the, on what's called the Berwyn Mountains. Uh, and it's, as you might you know, suggest it's very controversial, but some, the, the local residents in Wales heard this boom, felt, you know, things in the house shook and so on. And the local constabulary were sent out to, they thought something had crashed up on the hills and these strange lights were seen. And even a local nurse, I forget her name, thought, I'll go up there in case anyone's injured. You know, I can give first aid. And she turned out to be one of the main witnesses and the official explanation was that it was a, you know, meteorite impact. Mm -hmm. um, that's come from the Met Office, I believe. But then you get the UFO investigators and conspiracy theories saying, no, it was, you know, military was seen there. And it, it's not, it wouldn't be unusual for the military to be seen in those areas because they, they're training parts of Wales anyway. But that, that's the only one. And again, it, because it's so controversial, it really didn't fit into what I was writing about. Um, but uh, it's it, it's the, it's the only one that I'm aware of. I, I dare say there may be one or two others, but not nothing like Roswell. I can assure you. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned uh, two or three cases. Is there like a favourite among the ones that you've listed? <sighs> Obviously, the one I, I talked about that's in my back back garden at uh, Normanton, and you know, but the, the, there is an incident in Wales. Um, this is back in July 1975. Um, I'm half Welsh. My father mm -hmm. was born in Wales. I cannot speak a word of the language. Uh, you know, I come from, I'm born and bred in the north of England, so I struggle even with English, Dean, let, <laughs> let, let alone Welsh. But it's a place called Macalenth, and I've probably pronounced it totally wrong. But a young lad who was, who was simply called Trevor, he went to the beach one day with his, with his father. So his father sat on the beach and, be, you know, just behind the beach, there's some rocks. So, Dad, can I, can I climb the rocks? Yeah, you know, it's what you do, what the kids do at the beach. So he climbed up these rocks, the Trevor. And when he gets to the top, he sees this thing. It's circular. It's got lights going around it. It's on the ground and it has a dome on it. And he, he you know, he hides behind another rock. He bobs down behind it and he keeps popping his head up. 
And, in, and this, this is the really bizarre part. If that wasn't bizarre enough, inside this glass dome, we see these two shapes, Dean. Mm -hmm. And inside these shapes, it's almost like liquefied. And it's all squirming and moving and churning around. And this dome starts to open. So he's off, Trevor, flies mm -hmm. down the rocks to his dad and says to his dad, dad, there's a flying saucer. And then he turns around and he's off again, back up the rocks, thinking his father's following him in his footsteps. And his dad's thinking, what did he say? <laughs> and he looks up and he can see Trevor up the rocks and still hiding behind this rock. And when he pops up, this thing has, has, has gone. And that is one of my favorites because it is so bizarre. Bizarre, yeah. You know, and I've looked through the literature to see if I could find something described similar or the same of these two squiggly creatures that he saw, but I can't. And of course, if you're talking about fabricating things, well, you, know, you know, there was plenty of science fiction aliens that you could call upon uh, at, at that time frame, certainly 1975. I mean, mm -hmm. Doctor Who was, was a big TV yep. program like it is now. Plenty of science fiction to call it, but I've never seen anything like that anywhere. Right. And um, it's just a favourite, yeah. Yeah. And and does your research indicate that there's an area in the UK that is a real hotspot for UFOs? There's no, no real hotspot for this type of um, incidents, as outlined in my book. There has been at times hotspots for UFO sightings. For example, in the 1960s, it was a place called Warminster, which is in Wiltshire, which is the west part of, of, of England. Um, in the, certainly in the 1980s, it was areas in and around the Yorkshire Dales National Park in North Yorkshire. And then in the 90s, it was a place in Scotland uh, called Bonnybridge. Uh, things, things seem to have settled down in all three of those areas. So there were th sort of three hotspots down, down the decades but not at the moment that I'm aware of, Dean. Yeah. Um, well, one of my favourite places on, on the planet to, um, you know, source UFO events is Brazil, and they're always exciting. Is there anything in UK history that can match, you know, events like they have in Brazil? I, I don't think anywhere in the, on the planet can match the things that have happened in, in, in Brazil and South America, you know, as yeah. a whole. Um, but there are one or two cases that in the book, like the one I just mentioned in Wales, mm -hmm. if we'd have changed the location and put that in Brazil, it probably wouldn't have surprised us, probably wouldn't have st stood out because of the, the high strangeness accounts that the country seems to have. Yep. Um, I, was, I was lucky, I, I published a, um, um, a book, UFO Contacts in Brazil, um, by a colleague of mine, Tiago, mm -hmm. and that is full of them. I mean, absolutely full of them. And I think Bob Pratt in the United States, he did a book on, on UFOs in Brazil. I, th I think Bob's sadly no longer with us. Um, so it is a, if you like the high strangeness things, that's, as you say, yeah, yeah. I mean, Brazil is the place to go. It really is. Yep. And yep. of course, James Fox, filmmaker, who's, mm -hmm. although he's from the UK, he's based in the States. He's making a, a new documentary about a particular incident in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And, I, and that, that, I think he's all but finished it. So we'll, we'll wait okay. and see what happens. Yep, yep. Uh, you, you mentioned your other, uh, other book, Without Consent. Um, how do these two books differ? Well, Without Consent um, deals primarily with close encounters, alien abduction. Mm -hmm and missing time cases. So there are some overlaps between the two. Um, all of, pretty much all of the abduction cases mentioning without consent have got beings or creatures, whatever you want to call them, in association with it. Whereas in UFO landings UK, they don't necessarily have. There's, there's a bit of both. So sometimes something is seen on the ground and there's, there's, there's no beings connected to it. Um, but there is an abduction case, about, and I've put that in there, and it involved a lady called Linda Jones. Uh, Linda, again, I can't remember the date, it's the 70s. Uh, she lived up near uh, Manchester, a place called Didsbury. And she was with her, her children, 
in the, the fields behind where she lived, picking some wildflowers when this, this thing descended. And I get it's a long story. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that always sticks with me, this is an abduction account. When asked what this experience was like, uh, Linda said it was biblical. That's wow. the way she describes it. And that's in, in the new book as well. So I thought I'd put it, because this thing, you know, came to the ground as well. So I thought I'll, I'll put an abduction case in it. Simply mm -hmm. just, you know, for, to, to show there is an overlap, if you like. And I'll never forget that. You know, out of the whole case, it's that phrase that, that I've met Linda, you know, I've met and I've spoken to her and I've interviewed her uh, and there's photos of her in there and there's, you know, artwork of, of what she saw. And she said it was biblical. And, and you know, I can't, I, you know, I'll always remember that. I really will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, whenever someone uses the, the term biblical, you, you think of biblical proportions and it's quite yeah. spectacular. Yeah. Philip, uh, UFO Landings UK is is out now, available everywhere, including Amazon. Yeah, it's it's in paperback, it's in hardback, it's a Kindle, and we've just just released it also as an audio book. Yep. It's not me narrating it, so you'll be <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to understand what's being said. And like I say, Amazon's the place to go and find it. Yeah, you've always got a project on the go. Uh, have you got something coming up? again in the in the near future well like, like i said um next month it's the anniversary of flying saucer so on june the first got a book being published by a gentleman called charles lear charles lives in new york and it's simply called the flying saucer investigators it's about the early pioneers that followed in in the wake of kenneth arnold and it it's a it's a history book mm -hmm. but it, it and it goes right the way through until the end of project blow book in 1969 uh, and then, of course, come July, it's the anniversary of Roswell. Roswell, yeah. most famous case. And I will be publishing a book called Understanding Roswell by Kevin Randall. And, um, you know, and that will be to coincide with, with the 75th anniversary. And then there'll be more later this year. I've, I've, I've literally just entered discussions for next year to um, possibly publish a book about um, what we call hominids, Bigfoot, if you want. Right, right. In Russia. Okay. So in Russia, not here in the UK, not not in, in the United mm -hmm. States, but mm -hmm. in Russia, the, the largest country in the world. So forget all the, you know, the, the nasty things that's happening with the, with the Russian military. Uh, this is a PhD from Russia, and, and I've literally just entered discussion. So that, that may also come out next year. Fingers yep. crossed. Yeah, that's a that's a frightening location for you know Bigfoot stories. Uh, Russia, it's there's, there's some some amazing stories to come out of that country. Philip, thank you once again for your time. Look forward to speaking with you again in the near future, and uh, let's uh, let's hope this book does really well. Well, thank you, Dean, and um, you know everyone, rush out and buy a copy, please. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Philip Mantle joining us today.